Good evening, everybody. I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. Whether you're watching on Crowdcast or Facebook Live, we are glad that you could join us uh, tonight. And to those of you new to one of our events, uh, the Women in Politics Institute is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs. And we aim to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training and facilitate research and discussions like this on women in politics. And certainly by any measure, uh, the subject of tonight's discussion is a giant when we think of powerful and trailblazing women in politics, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, uh, who has represented California's 43rd district since 1991. Uh, she is of course the chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee and has spent more than 40 years of her life in public service. Uh, and in the course of that has become uh, a cultural icon in her own right. And so fortunately for us, there is a uh, terrific new book that seeks to paint what they call a three-dimensional picture uh, of the Congresswoman. Uh, it's fun and it's an inspiring read and really sheds light on the woman behind the memes, the gifs, and the novelty t-shirts that we all love. And so uh, we are thrilled to be joined by the co-author of Reclaiming Her Time, uh, The Power of Maxine Waters, mm -hmm. uh, Elena Andrews Dyer, who's a reporter with the Washington Post. And uh, before we start, also I wanna let everybody know that we're gonna save plenty of time for your questions. So at the bottom of the screen, you will notice a button to ask a question. So please uh, do that during the course of our discussion. and. Uh, You'll also be able to upvote questions from other folks that uh, you're, if you're interested in the same question they are. Um, and if you miss any of the discussions uh, and you wanna share it with friends, uh, the replay will be available at the same link that you used to register. So with that, welcome, Helena, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, I'm excited. So you write about uh, the biggest lesson that studying Maxine Waters has taught you. Tell us a little bit about what that is and how her life has really embodied that. I think for me, when it comes to Congresswoman Waters, and I mean, anyone who, whether all you know her is from her tweets or if you've been following <laughs> her career in her literally five decades in public service, is that she brings her full self to every aspect of what she does, right? And for right. a black woman, for a black woman of her generation that in and of itself is revolutionary, but she doesn't, she does not play small ever. And she doesn't, she doesn't do a ton of code switching at all. She's, I think that's one of the reasons why she's been so successful in representing mm -hmm. her district, even as it's been redrawn, I don't even, you know, probably half a dozen times is that she's still very much herself and who she has such a strong definition of self. And she's talked about that, you know, she didn't, you know, like a lot of women who grew up in um, her time, you know, who she was or whether she would be just a quote unquote wife or, you know, just a quote unquote mother, um, that was called to question and she decided Honestly, she had already gotten married. And you know, if you know her personal story, you know, she got married right out of high school, as you did mm -hmm. right, in the late um, 50s and moved from St. Louis to California for job opportunities, as a lot of people did, especially African Americans. Right. And, um, you know, she just got to work, had two children, was married. And it wasn't until she sort of started to think about who she was as a person, what she wanted, um, did her goals start to change. She went and got her bachelor's in social work because she says as a child, mm -hmm. social workers always had a lot of power in her house because she grew up the fifth out of 13 children raised by <laughs> uh, Right, and she, she saw literally how policies come to bear like inside your home and that energized her and invigorated her to work uh, and do the type of work that she does. So I, I say all that to say the biggest lesson I think I learned in just studying her, studying who she is beyond the meme is that she's just always herself and she doesn't, mm -hmm. she doesn't apologize for it ever. She leans into it. You know, there was she a was lot of authentic before authenticity was cool, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Even even if it could have possibly cost her politically, right? Yeah. She, yeah. she didn't care. She was always going to be who she was. And you write about, I mean, you mentioned that she's the fifth of 13, which is incredible enough. 
Um, but you also write about her mother um, and who helped her teach her what strength is all about. Tell us a little bit about uh, about her mom and um, what she went through and how she inspired her daughter. Well, her mother, Velma, who um, her family referred to uh, as my dear, which a lot of African-American families do, is short mm -hmm. for my dear. Um, you know, again, was from the South and moved to St. Louis to seek new job opportunities during the Great Migration. And, um, you know, she was married more than once, had, as, as we say, 13 children who she ended up having to raise on her own. And mm -hmm. Max Waters will say, you know, her mother, I think, had perhaps a sixth grade education. Um, she relied on government assistance when she needed to. Um, and taught her children basically like just a lot of life skills, right? Mm -hmm. And something very similar, I think when I think about my own family, my mother is one of eight uh, and you know, my grandparents are from the South and you know, my grandmother wasn't too, uh, you know, uh, hugs and kisses and baking cookies, you know, that wasn't like sort of how she showed love. She showed love by like teaching you how to survive, yeah. Um, yeah. teaching you how to be strong, right? Teaching you that, you know, if you wanted something, you had to go out and get it and you had to ask for it. And um, Congresswoman Waters will say, you know, they never thought growing up that, you know, you didn't speak your mind all the time, right? Because if you're five out of 13 kids, like if you want something, you better let somebody know, right? Yes. Otherwise you're not going to get it. Um, and I think that she learned a lot of tough lessons from her mom when it just came to being really outspoken. Um, and also just making the best out of what you have. You know, I don't think her mother ever taught her this lesson and she, she talks about that, you know, they grew up poor, mm -hmm. but poverty was never something that she, that Maxine Waters was ashamed of, you know, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. they, um, that they obviously had to overcome in a lot of different ways, but, you know, she still did great at school. You know, she was very active in her community and community center, uh, teachers, her teachers, poured into her and her mother opened the door for that and opened the door mm -hmm. to that and was very receptive of, of that. Um, and I think from that, she learned sort of one, how community um, and how community can be so essential in just the rearing of children and making sure right. that everyone is successful. Um, but also that your circumstances don't define where you're going to go in life. So for a lot of young people who um, might not be familiar with the whole or the three-dimensional Maxine Waters, um, they've certainly seen in their social media feeds the GIFs going <laughs> around of her. And I wanted to play um, quickly a little bit of an excerpt of a, a hearing, which forms the basis for the title of, of your book, um, just to show everybody um, where this kind of where this came from. Um, so let me play that for you guys uh, here. Is there some reason why I did not get a response uh, to the letter that I sent, May 23rd? So, uh, Ranking Member Waters, first of all, let me thank you for your service to California. Being a resident of California, uh, I appreciate everything that thank you've you done very much. for the community I there. I don't want to take my time. I, I've, I also I have am. appreciated the opportunity to be claiming my time several times. Reclaiming my time. We're doing our, our reclaiming my time. The time belongs to the gentle lady from California. <laughs> reclaiming her time, right? <laughs> So I, that has now just become the meme that people use, right? But um, there's there's obviously more to her than than that. But certainly, as you talked about, bringing her authentic self, speaking up for herself when she needs to, and doing that sort of reclaiming her time is is the basis of of her success in politics in many ways, right? Absolutely, and I think what's funny about that moment are not necessarily funny, but that's really interesting about that moment yeah. is that the phrase reclaiming my time is common on the right. hill, right? That is common practice of how members um, talk to one another. It's basically how they say like, you know, you know, I yield the time, I'll take the time, all these, that's how they maintain decorum amongst one another, right? And you say reclaiming my time, it's basically being like, please shut up. It's my right. turn to talk, right? Um, <laughs> But that's how they talk to each other on the hill. So it, she has said, 
that for her, even that moment was surprising because she was like, I'm just, I was just doing what I normally do, right? I just was saying what I would normally say in that situation. But I think right. what people saw was someone unafraid to speak, you know, not even truth to power, but just to, to say like, you know what? No, I'm not gonna let you railroad me. And and it's funny in the rest of that clip, she says something like, you know, don't don't I don't need you to take my time up with telling me how great I am. You know, such <laughs> a Maxine Waters thing to say. Because uh, she's like, you know, I'm not here for that. I, I know I'm great. Thanks. Let's get on to this business at hand. Um, and I think it just exploded at this moment because it particularly because she, who she was speaking to, obviously, and and because there was just like this bottled up moment, um, this bottled up energy where people wanted to say like, no, I want you to tell the truth. I want you to answer my questions um, in a really fraught political time. But she's had so many moments, you know, she's, she's, yeah. she, what's so interesting about her is that she just pops up at, and doesn't pop up. She's been working, you know, the whole time, <laughs> but you see her in so many really um, crucial inflection moments in history. And there she is, there's Maxine Waters. And that's, I think what Eric and I, my co-author, R. Eric Thomas, learned about her knowing, you know, I'm actually from Maxine's district in California. Um, so I've always known who Maxine Waters is since elementary school, right? And yeah. Eric sort of came to her from her pop culture moments because he writes a column for Elle magazine. And in our research and learning even more about her, it was just like, oh wait, she was at the National Women's Conference? Like, oh wait, mm -hmm. she, you know, she got energized and activated in politics immediately after the Watts riots, you know, it's just, she was there walking Bill Clinton through, you know, the the burned out streets of Los Angeles after the LA insurrection in the nineties. You know, she's, she was the one fighting for South African divestment during apartheid. You know, it's just like, she's right. like there. Well, there's a, another Maxine moment um, that you write about. And this is, um, which you called the modern Maxine era had started. Um, she was walking out of a, a classified briefing on the Russian terror uh, investigation where Jim Comey, the FBI director, uh, was testifying. And this had to be probably the world's shortest press conference. Yes. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me play that for folks uh, to get a sense of, of what happened in that uh, 15 seconds uh, <laughs> in that press conference. Yes. Can I help you? What do you want? I'm fine. No, it's classified and we can't tell you anything. All I can tell you is the FBI director has no credibility. And there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and there she struts in the heels that she always wears on uh, on those marble floors. She's told it. it that was so, such a Maxine moment. And the reason, one, as you say, it was like the shortest press conference ever. <laughs> and Eric wrote the chapter on that in the book. And he's just like, and then she just like throws the whole thing in the trash. It's like, she calls everyone there. She's like, what do you want? It's like, I want to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then she's like, well, I don't, I don't have anything to say, except the FBI director has no credibility, as if that wasn't going to be like the headline of every major story the next day or the next hour, you know? Exactly, exactly, exactly. It's, it is classic her, which is just, you know, nope, can't tell you anything. That's it. Bye. Good, good night. And I'm going to like strut off looking fabulous. Next <laughs> left. And you write that like former staffers will, you know, call her the Energizer Bunny because she is always on the go. Absolutely. I mean, she is, she has a, a very young staff. She's up, you know, she's the, the type of Congress person who's, you know, up in the morning texting people, letting them know she flies back to her district even now, um, mm -hmm. nearly every weekend. Um, and she, you know, expects, I talked to one person who had, who had been a speechwriter for her and they're saying, you know, sometimes people will fly back to their district and you don't really, you know, even if they have to give a speech or something, we won't hear from them until maybe Monday morning, no big deal. No, 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 not Congresswoman Waters. She will be checking in with you, mm -hmm. asking, even if she's just appearing, you know, 
at a Baptist church in the morning, maybe giving a short speech. She still wants to make sure she's completely prepped. Like she works, 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 um, and shows no signs of slowing down at all. Well, you mentioned to the kind of her entree into, I guess, pre-politics was from a community organizing component. And you mentioned the Watts riots. Tell us, give us a sense of what, what she did during that and how that kind of maybe propelled her into actually um, running for office uh, herself. Well, she started, uh, so as I said, she moved from St. Louis, her and her, mm -hmm. her and her first husband after they got married to um, Southern California. And she was working at the phone company. That's a good mm -hmm. job. Yeah. <laughs> um, she was working at the phone company and uh, it was not too long after the Watts riots. And she had gotten a call from a friend of hers who was letting her know that, you know, in response to that, right, there's all this policy coming down, um, specifically about investing in communities that had been, you know, completely ignored, right? Um, and Head Start was a huge part of that, right? People familiar with the Head Start program, which mm -hmm. is preschool um, uh, for families who wouldn't necessarily be able to afford it. And, you know, before you would go into kindergarten to, you know, give kids a head start in life. And so she applied and she worked in the Head Start program as sort of a community organizer. She um, would bridge the gap between like the parent groups and what the parents and what they wanted with policy, right, in City Hall. Um, and that's how she got her start, just grassroots organizing um, in uh, public housing in South Central Los Angeles. And from there, you know, people knew her. They knew her in the community, just as they do now. You know, they would mm -hmm. call her by her name, knew who she was, knew that she was someone who was constantly advocating. Because like I say, she she grew up in that situation, right? She grew up in a situation where she knew that access to public funds and funding and education, all those things were just, that's everything, right? Um, and then from there, she started working on campaigns for council members because people knew her as an organizer. They knew her as someone who knew um, the Watts area, the South, what we now call South Central Los Angeles, South Los Angeles area. Um, and, she moved up in the in the ranks, being, becoming a chief of staff or council member, um, and was known as someone who, you know, if you wanted to get that voting block out, if you wanted to get your message out to those people, you had to go through Maxine. If you if there was a piece of legislation that you were considering, you asked Maxine first. She was constantly known. I talked to people who had worked with her at the time. Like she was always people were like, she was the smartest person in the room. She knew that constituency mm -hmm. inside and out, and they were loyal to her because they knew she was truly representing them. And then this is before she was actually a representative, right? right. Um, and so that's sort of where she got really politically activated um, right before she ran for um, a, a, the California State Assembly. Yeah. Yeah. And you write her, um, you said in city halls, Maxine's own political muscle was reaching P90X levels. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there's also, you have a great quote in the book too, um, and, and I think this has sort of just been her her mantra from the beginning. She says, um, at some point, I uh, deciding that I had been silenced uh, by this need to be liked and not wanting to step on anybody's toes or hurt anybody's feelings. But she said, what I discovered is I really don't care whether people like me or not. And that freed her up. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. That goes back to our whole talk about authenticity and yeah, who she is exactly. and understanding herself. And she, she tells that she that quote comes from her talking about encounter groups, which again was something that I didn't really know about before, but it was something that a, a feminist quote unquote mm -hmm. were doing. And, and I say quote unquote, because people were like labeling, labeling folks as feminists is derogatory at the time, but women's groups getting together and having these encounter sessions were literally, they would just talk about what they wanted out of life, right? And this is revolutionary. <laughs> this is revolutionary for groups of women to get together and say like, this is who I wanna be. This is what I wanna pursue. Let's talk about our ambitions. Let's talk about our fears. Let's talk about yeah. you know where we see ourselves in five years. People were not doing that. <laughs> now that's all we do, right? <laughs> we're not doing that in the late 60s, uh, before the late 60s, 70s, when, it when we're talking about the women's movement. So 
she was participating in these groups and then just finding herself, like really mm -hmm. finding herself and discovering herself. And this is, again, after she's become a wife and a mom and has been working for some years, after she's gotten her degree while having two small children, then going through you know, a divorce from her first husband. And she's just kind of un, you know, uncovering, peeling back the layers and figuring out what she wants and who she wants to be. And it, all of these things were pointing to public service. Um, and the way she did that, again, was in that quote where she talks about like, you know, I was discovering who I was and then I just I didn't care what people thought of that. Like right. she didn't care if people thought she was too ambitious. She didn't care if people thought like, oh, well, she doesn't need to be at this meeting. Like she doesn't know anything. Like, no, she's gonna show up. She's gonna speak her mind. Um, and that I think from the time she was elected as an, her, as an assemblywoman and, and went to the California state legislator on is when you really see the, you know, I don't give a, you know, what, <laughs> Max <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah, that you see today. I think it really started with that first, um, her, her first campaign. And she, I mean, you mentioned this too, she considered herself a feminist in this 70s. But for a black woman in that that time, that was sort of a radical notion. Um, Absolutely, it was sort of feminism at that time, and you write about this was considered more of a white woman's thing. Absolutely, um, for you know good reason, right? Um, feminism was definitely considered like a white woman's movement because those that, that was the face of feminism at the time. So you had this sort of like um, womanist versus feminist um, competing ideologies um, and. Maxine will say that she, even in talking to her mentors in the community who were said like, oh, this isn't for us, that's not something you should do. And she said, well, we have similar ideals. We have aligned goals. We all want the same things. Um, and that's where you see her participation in the National Women's Conference, her, her the start of her friendship with Gloria Steinem, which continues mm -hmm. to this day. They're very good friends. Um, you know, and Patsy Mink and Patty Mink and, and Bella Absberg, like, they're all getting together and she was right in the middle of that. And when it comes to the National Conference of Women, she was there as they're trying to like ratify these different, what happened at the National Conference of Women as they're ratifying these planks, right? Of the, you know, basically the, 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 the Women's Bill of Rights, right? And Maxine Waters was the glue to the quote unquote minority women's plank yeah. um, where minority women were literally defining at the time what they want, you know, and we're talking about native women, we're talking about black women, we're talking about uh, Latinx women and what all their different goals, but, but similar goals. Right. And she was sort of the glue that held a lot of that together. And when she, she was also chosen to read the plank aloud before they ratified it as an entire uh, conference, as an entire assembly. And really what they're describing then in the seventies is intersectionality. Again, right. they didn't, they didn't say that. Right. 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 Exactly what they were talking about. And there's Maxine Waters, you know, <laughs> there's this woman who, again, we all know from the memes and the gifts, literally they're describing intersectionality, describing the the double bind that women of color face. And it's it's revolutionary and it's incredible. And there she is right in the middle of it. And she actually, when she, one of the first things, she, maybe it was the first uh, piece of legislation she introduced when she um, came to the assembly, um, she introduced a piece of legislation that would officially change the title that mostly women uh, went by, you know, to uh, from assemblyman to assembly member. Yes, yes. When she got to the California state legislature, they called everyone assemblyman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone was just called an assemblyman, regardless um, of your gender. And so it was literally. I want to say it was like the first day. I mean, literally the first thing uh, she introduced was to change it to assembly member, and they. At the time, and I think this is this is exactly how it happened. I might be misremembering, but it passed like almost immediately, only because like they were shocked by it. It's like who is this person who just like <laughs> rolled into oh, the and here. and, and um, suggest this, and then it passed, and then and then it's like everyone like came out of this fog that she you know put over them when she came in, and this like just complete power move, and they reversed it. But then of course it came back. So now that is that is known it's it's she is known as the person in the california state legislature that changed um how people were referred to and it's just when she talks about it she was just like yeah that's not right like 
I'm not right. a simple man. Like, <laughs> I don't want to be referred to as that. So it's immediately she changed it. And it seems, um, you know, it seems like a small thing, but like, you know, what you're named, how people refer to you is, is huge, you know, yeah. and, it, yeah. and it, it means so much. And so I think even at that time, she, again, as we're talking about her defining herself, she was immediately yeah. like, no, this is not what you're going to call me. So let's, <laughs> let's change this. Sorry, you guys have been doing this for however, you know, many decades. Nope, I don't like it. We're changing it. And they changed it. And she started to take on more of a, of a national profile. I mean, you mentioned her involvement in the uh, women's conference. I guess that was 1977. But she was also, as an assembly person, very involved in the whole issue of apartheid in South Africa and using divestiture as a strategy. Um, talk a little bit about her, her leadership in that area. It she was the first to to begin introducing a bill that would call for Californians, specifically we're talking about um, universities that had yeah. stock in, 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 in investments in, in countries that did business yeah, with South Africa. Pension funds and all of yeah. that, right? Right, yeah. exactly. And it was to divest the pension funds. And it, I mean, we're talking di divest, and that now we get like heading into financial stuff. But... Um, <laughs> in the companies that did, you know, did business with South Africa that were part right. of the, the stocks and how they were, whatever. And I mean, we're talking about billions, it was billions of dollars because California is the seventh largest economy in the world, you know, and we're talking about a ton of money, especially talking about the university system, right? Yeah. Um, and she introduced this bill and people were like, no thanks, like, absolutely not. We're not doing this. No one agreed with her on it. Um, folks in legislator didn't legislature didn't agree. The governor didn't agree. It was like, this is not what we're going to do. Um, and there were a lot of, when it came to the divestment movement in general, a lot of back and forth about whether it was financially, whether it was a good idea, even for, you know, South Af black South Africans, right. With divesting yeah. in these companies affect them. Um, right. But it was a movement really led by students in this country that said, no, it'll put the pressure on them, right? She introduced the bill, I want to say from 79, right? And she got to the assembly, I believe, in 76, 77. So it was one of her earliest pieces of legislation in her first couple of years there. And then subsequently every year for six years and just kept pushing it, kept pushing it. Um, and just wouldn't back down. And eventually, as the country caught on, right, and the movement, it, you know, it, 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 Columbia, my alma mater students were pushing for it, and it was all over the country. Um, Reagan finally kind of got hip to it at the time, President Reagan, mm -hmm. um, that this would be, it was obviously a moral issue, but that it would actually produce practical results, right? Push the South African government to change their, you know, years long um, tied to this oppressive government regime. Um, and she just never backed down from it. And she, at the time, once she got it passed, so now she's in the legislature for almost a decade, a little bit under a decade once it got passed. And at the time, at that point, she was, I believe the majority whip, she was like the number four person, right? In yeah. the assembly once it finally got passed. And she was, a, I think she was the chairwoman of the Waynes and Means Committee at that time. So she had so much political power right. once it, to, to get it passed once it eventually got passed. And when it did, they, the entire chamber stood up and applauded her, right? Which is very much, I think, in line with sort of her political career is that she'll come, I mean, we'll talk about it if we're going to talk about, you know, impeaching former President Trump. She'll, she comes with what you consider a radical idea way ahead of her time, right? And the, But she doesn't back down. She, she keeps right. pushing it. Um, and then years later, everyone's like, oh, wait, Matt, yeah, she was right about that. That that was something that we yeah. should do. And you it mentioned, so... I want to ask you too, because around that same time period, also she ended up getting remarried uh, to her current husband, Sidney Williams, yes. who was a former linebacker for the Cleveland Browns. Yes. Um, but they have a very supportive relationship with each other. And there was a quote um, from him in the book um, where he's talking about sort of 
the attention and the spotlight being on her and he basically saying, you know, I have my career, she has hers. I'm a former football player in the pros. So all the accolades she's getting right now, like I've gone through, um, it's her time to shine. And I, you mm -hmm. know, I admire her for that. And so she's had this very supportive uh, relationship that has been important as well. Absolutely. I think when we were first, so Eric and I, like just going like way back to tell this story, yeah. Eric and I were approached to write the book specifically because HarperCollins Day Street, our publisher, um, they, they had published a comparable book about um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg called The Notorious RPG. Yeah. And they, you know, a, a, a quote unquote political book, but not really more of a cultural commentary book, right? I'm a cultural reporter by trade, even though I've covered politics, Eric is a playwright by trade. <laughs> um, and one of the, just the similarities that's in stark relief between um, Justice Ginsburg, late Justice Ginsburg mm -hmm. and Congresswoman Waters is that they had husbands who were just, I don't even want to say superhumanly supportive. They're supportive <laughs> as husbands should be, as any partner should be, right? But in their time, right, you know, um, husbands who were supportive in a way that you might not expect a man to be, right, because of social norms at the time. Right. And I think that you know, when it comes to Sydney, she has just always felt that they. They're, they've always been equals. They met um, They met while they were both working on City Hall. They were both working in the same council member's um, office. And one of her friends said to me that basically he had come into the office or an office party. And it was like immediately Maxine was like, oh, I have to meet him. You know, and in short order, I don't think, I think in like two years they were married. And I think it was because they always came to each other as equals. And I think that Sydney delights in in her career, in her success. And again, she she when it comes to her like national prominence, it's in waves, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, before her last like meme explosion, she was just doing the work as you know, doing the work of a congresswoman as she does. Um, and she's on the I, financial services committee, which is just sort of, you know, not always in the front pages of the paper, right? Unless there's exactly. a of some sort. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, right now her big, you know, she's dealing with, you know, consumer stuff Rock and, and, and yeah. you know, like small bank loans and things like that. Yeah. It's not always sexy, um, but he's always there on any, you know, you see her on red carpets now and you always see him there. <laughs> not someone who necess who needs the spotlight and that quote and that quote is from like decades ago um right. where he's just like you know i did it i've 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 been you know the person who was out there and i got it now it's her turn and it's been her turn for a long time <laughs> it's been her turn for decades um and i think you know he's always been just very steadfast and at her side throughout um her career and their marriage and um they don't they they're not like super public they don't talk a ton about their marriage but just anyone who sees i i think there was i was talking to one staffer i think she like hurt her leg a couple of years ago uh because he normally says he doesn't live here like he stays in california um and he like uh, you know flew to washington and was with her walking her through the hall like he's just like they're just one of those couples when people talk about couple goals, like that is definitely them. So she comes to Congress uh, in the 1990 election. She's basically hand selected by um, uh, Congressman Hawkins who was retiring. I think he was like 82 years old, but he calls her right before he announces her retirement. And by this point, you know, she's been in the state assembly for 14, 15 years and has this obviously political power structure already built. Um, and so she's able to win um, overwhelmingly in that election. Yes, handily and ever since, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, one thing about the Congresswoman is that she's always been, we talk about this um, in, uh, we do these things called timeouts where it's like, points in time, but they didn't really work with how we were doing, setting up the book thematically, but we did like a timeout and just on the president. Yeah. Um, and 
putting her in juxtaposition with um, President Obama. And she has always been sort of machine politics. I mean, she came up in machine politics in California where you, you know, you you have your slate and and they work, you know, you work for each other, all the sorts of things. So Gus Hawkins obviously was part of that. And when he called her, reaching out to her, it was like, okay, it is your it's your time now, Maxine, basically. Um, and she'd always been toying with with going to Washington. That was something that she, I think, was had been planning, um, and was eyeing that seat. Everybody was eyeing the seat, mm-hmm. obviously. And I think it's funny because one of it was maybe in the L.A. Times there was a column about sort of how she was like, you know basically ushered in and, you know, obviously she, she just defeated everyone handily. And the question was, was she gonna change her style? Hmm. Your style, like, oh, she's done well in California with these, you know, where they, where they call her kerosene Maxine and <laughs> she's so confrontational and aggressive yeah. and all these things. But when she goes to Washington, she's gonna have to change it up if she wants to do anything. And it's like, Oh ha ha ha! Oh, oh <laughs> that's sure. it. yeah, that is not that's not how this is gonna work. Um, and it's not how it worked. You know, she she gets she gets here and and immediately sort of does what she does. She doesn't right. kowtow. She doesn't back down. Um, she pretty much plays it just as she did in California. And it's I watched. Um, I think it was on C-SPAN where they interviewed a bunch of freshmen coming in at the time. Um, and there were five of them, but obviously it, well, it was Maxine and, and like four other white men, obviously, but one yeah. of them was um, Congressman Boehner. Um, and um, they're sitting down and talking and it's in, it's so clear. I mean, she's coming as a, a you know, a middle-aged woman to DC, right? And right. she just, she is like leaning back in her chair, just answering whatever questions. Like she's not afraid. She's not hesitant. You know what I mean? She is just coming yeah. in like, oh, I'm ready to fight with the lions, and I have no, you know, I, I have no reservations with this. This is exactly where I need to be. You know, she is comfortable wherever she is. And then the Rodney King verdict happens, which is right in her home district. Yes, absolutely. And then she catapulted more into the national spotlight and takes the leadership on that topic as well. Again, if we're talking about her being ahead of the game when it comes to um, just what we may have considered controversial at the time, she refused to call it a riot. She refused to call it a riot at the time. She always called it, you know, an uprising or an insurrection, or an insurrection. Sorry. And I mean, she lost her district office. One of her district offices burned down to the ground. You know, she, it's not like she didn't have skin in the game. Yeah. Um, but she immediately, she went down there and she was, you know, handing out food and supplies to people who needed it. She was going on local TV and saying, you know, this is this isn't going on local TV at the time saying this is not a riot. This is what happens when communities are ignored. This is what happens when people, you know, when you have a power keg of policy exploding mm-hmm. in a mm-hmm. community, right? And folks were upset about that. You know, it's you know, and not just the mainstream. I mean, black folks were upset about that. Some black people thought she shouldn't be talking like that. Black people who subscribe to respectability politics, um, who thought, no, we have to, you know, talk about nonviolence and all these sorts of things. And she's just like, that's that's not where my focus is. My focus is this is what happens to in these communities that have been, you know, subject to all of the systematic racism. And this is, you know, this is what happens when the when pressure bursts bur- pipes. Um, so yeah, she was a leader on that. She walked Bill Clinton through her district at the time. This is, he was running, for, and this is the interesting thing about Maxine because she was very good friends with Jesse Jackson um, yeah. and towed both lines. I think at, at one point he had, she had, he had roles in both campaigns at one point, right? Because again, when it comes to Maxine, it's like, you know, her her goal is her agenda. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's loyal political. She's she's a loyal political ally, uh, but her role was her agenda. And um, yeah, she definitely was at the forefront of 
of that and of the messaging there, um, messaging that we're still going back to today, still going back right. to today. Right, exactly. Um, well, you mentioned Clinton, so I wanted to ask you because you also write about her relationship with President Obama, which wasn't always the best. I mean, she was an early supporter of, of Hillary Clinton, right? Yes, early supporter of Hillary Clinton's, you know, it was sort of like a 20, fifth hour um, uh, where she kind of swooped in and, and and made sure that, you know, President Obama became the president, first black president in the United States. Um, but as we talk about them, I mean, you know, she's machine politics. She was very much, um, I don't want to say old school, but old school. And, you know, President Obama ruffled some feathers, especially when he <laughs> when he gave the speech at um, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, ALC yeah. Center, um, where he talked about people having their bedroom slippers on, right? <laughs> Saying that, you know, the people in the room, you know, needed to, to stand up with him and march and do the fight and basically like get up off your tushies. And the next day she went on, I think she did like six hits the next day, and was like, I don't know who he was talking about. I don't know talking about me, you know, or any of my colleagues who literally were marching uh, during civil rights. She, yeah. you know, you know, at the end of it, she was like, I don't think he meant to say that, so I'm still going to support him, but uh, uh, don't say that, you know, basically. And they, they were never like super tight, um, and I think it sort of may have stemmed from that. But um, just this idea that again, she she had said to her constituents, you know, at the beginning of his of President Obama's presidency, you know, as soon as, if you are um, frustrated, let us know and we'll, you know, we're, we're holding back the Congressional Black Caucus um, for now, right? Um, he's the leader of our party, obviously, um, but let us know when you want us to like go hard on him. And I think that that was part of that, <laughs> where she was basically yeah. like, no, I'm gonna criticize you. I'm not going to hold back my criticism of you. Um, I'm gonna let you know what I think. And she definitely did. Well, and another president that has felt that is <laughs> President Trump, who she certainly has let you know what she thinks. Um, how has she just over during the you know past four years of the, of the Trump administration, um, positioned herself and been outspoken and vocal on all things uh, Trump related. Uh, and then we're going to take some questions. So um, if you, anybody has extra questions, throw them in there and we'll get to questions in just a minute. I mean, one of our big things when it came to the book, when we were first conceptualizing like what we would talk about and choosing what we talked about was Eric and I were both like, this is not a Trump book. We can't make this, you know, Maxine Waters versus it's Trump. Yeah. It's Trump, just because it wasn't like, that's not the interesting story. Like there's a lot more. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, that was four years of, you know, a 50 plus year career. Yeah. And look where he ended up. Look who ended up, you know, on top, who look who's still standing. Um, and I think, again, with her and what's exploded with her during Twitter and me, you know, if there was Twitter in the 70s while she was saying this kind of stuff, she, she'd she have national prominence um, starting from that point. But, you know, she just says what's on her mind when she says, you know, I'm not going to inauguration. That she started off, that was a starting shot, right? I'm not going to inauguration. I don't honor him. Uh, I won't be there. Um, from, you know, her saying he's, you know, just saying it plain. He's a liar. I think he's a liar, you know, um, to obviously her being one of the first people, most prominent Congress members to start calling for his impeachment, even when, uh, you know, Congressman Pelosi, Senator Schumer were both like, mm, I don't know about that. Like, we got other things to think about. She was like, no, impeach, impeach was chant, you know, every time she would do a public appearance, she'd be chanting it um, and just didn't back down from that whatsoever. So I think, again, it's just who she is in terms of not just being completely unafraid right. um, and unfiltered. I mean, it was the same thing when it came to George H.W. Bush, not a fan 
Uh, she was not a fan whatsoever, you know, basically called him, you know, racist um, at, at an event, um, specifically with in terms of his policies, specifically in terms of his response to the LA uprising. Um, and again, just would not back down from that and, and didn't apologize. And I think some people not knowing her long history may assume that it's stunt politics and you know these are just talking points and she just says this on msnbc but this is truly i think how she feels and mm -hmm. she comes from a place and she said this before because she started as an activist and grassroots like she comes from the activist place where she wants to agitate you know right. and, and really speak her mind and that plays out in in um in her politics in 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 the way that she shows up and not just in front of the TV cameras, like right. the camera goes off and she is <laughs> so the same thing. Yeah. Um, let me take a couple of questions here. Uh, let's see, this is one from uh, Isabel. And she says, uh, it feels like Congresswoman Waters is the living embodiment of Shirley Chisholm's idea of bringing a folding chair to the table and speaking one's mind. Are there younger Congresswomen who you see as continuing this legacy or, uh, for example, that we'll be calling the next anti in the next three decades. <laughs> um, well, yes, that's that is a, an astute observation. Shirley Chisholm is, you know, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan. These are people that the congresswoman like idolize, and and oh. we'll say that. Um, and you know, in terms of bringing a seat to the table, there's a story about again. She wasn't a big fan of President George H. W. Bush, who had a White House meeting about the you know policy response the federal response to um the la uprising and they did not invite maxine waters um mm -hmm. because he didn't mm -hmm. like her honestly and uh even though this happened in her district wow. and she got wind of this meeting and she just showed up at the white house um and was like oh hey guys uh my, my invitation must have got lost now like and just showed up that is absolutely who she is. And I think when we think, obviously now we think of the squad, right? right. Um, are definitely um, young politicians, young Congresswomen who, yes, could be in this fight for another 40 years um, and who definitely, I think why people idolize the squad, why um, they get, they get so much coverage and, and, and excitement when it comes to young people is because they seem like a group of women who came to Congress as their full selves, right? Came to Congress knowing what they wanted to do, came to Congress knowing the impact that they wanted to make and not taking their eyes off of that. And I think that that um, is absolutely just a, a legacy of Congressman Waters. And one thing that she says and when she she's talked previously about sort of the way that she's had to operate is having that thick skin as you talked about in the yeah. beginning you know just I don't care what people think of me and um, I think the squad definitely embodies that. Are there folks that um, she's sort of taken under her wing and mentored uh, other young um, female uh, either young female congresswomen or others that she has um, just been instrumental in helping along the way that you know? I have been asked that question before and honestly, I don't know. Um, uh -huh. it's, it's nothing that we've seen publicly or nothing that uh -huh. I heard her um, staffers behind the scenes, but I have to imagine that that's been happening. You know, yeah. I, I have to imagine that, you know, even that a Kamala Harris called up Maxine Waters, you know, from early in her political career in California, you know, and, and asked right. her how to navigate. I, I, right. I have to imagine that happens. I think the fact that we don't see it, to, in my mind, thinks it probably happens much more, you know what I mean? That she yeah, yeah, yeah. is about like, okay, I'm gonna slip you this note, you know, let's have coffee, let's have dinner, let's do a clash, let's, let's like really talk about strategy, but isn't someone, who um, publicizes that? And you know, I'm, I'm not sure why why she wouldn't, but um, I would assume that's happening. But I, I've been, we've been asked this before, and I've always I've tried <laughs> to answer, 
and I, I don't see it anywhere. Um, but that makes me think it's happening more. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, here's a question from Caitlin who says, uh, what was the most surprising thing you discovered about Representative Waters through your research? Um, I think the most surprising thing was the her appearance at the National Women's Conference. I, I didn't mm -hmm. like just uh, to my own detriment, did not know a ton about it. And then once I got deep into it, knowing that she was literally you know, one of the leaders there, um, I, it just, it hit me just like, wow, okay, this is someone who it, just in who she is, just finds herself at these incredible moments um, in history and continues to find herself in her eighties uh, in these incredible moments in history. And I think that was, for me, it was kind of like an aha moment. Like, okay, this is why we're writing this book. Um, Cause it's not something that I knew before, before uh, until I started. Yeah. Um, Caitlin also wants to know what you think is one of the most important things that Congresswoman Waters has accomplished so far in her career. I think, I mean, legislative, Legislatively, she's done a ton, obviously. Right. Um, she doesn't have, you know, there's not right now, she, there's no, you know, Dodd-Frank that, you know, that has her name on it that I think we can point to. I don't think that that's not going to happen. Obviously, her work with um, the anti-apartheid movement is huge. Um, mm -hmm. I think when it comes to her legacy, I don't think it it is necessarily going to be pieces of legislation like Dot Frank, like I mentioned. I think it is going to be sort of her, just just what she embodies and what she has um, stuck to her entire career. Um, again, like I say, she I think still envisions herself as an activist, you know, an activist politician, um, and. I think that that is going to be her biggest legacy, that that, that is the role that you can take, and that that is the type of politician you can be. Um, and then also this idea that you don't have to play small, especially as a woman in politics, to make your mark, um, yeah. to get things done. Um, yeah, I think her, her legacy is is cultural. I, I think that I think that's that's the biggest piece is just that she's changed. I think the way people view women in politics, black women in politics, um, and yeah, I think that's huge. Obviously, um, but yeah, you know, not counting out there will be some quote unquote waters bill that we're talking. You know, that we talk yeah. about years after that she she leaves the hill. Um, but right now, I think her biggest impact is cultural. So tell us what you are, you've written this book and now you're hard at work on another book. Um, yes. you're on book the post now. <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you're working on and what your next book is going to be. So my next book is called The Mamas, Parenting in the Age of Everything. I have two little ones who are downstairs like screaming um, <laughs> as we speak. Um, and that is, well, my first book, so this is my third book. My first book was called Bitches in New Black and it was uh, a memoir to like my twenties and being a young black woman, a young black professional. Um, and then obviously reclaiming her time. And then the mamas is sort of a look at um, just this crazy year, <laughs> like this, this, I call it like a, you know, an instapot of, of, of issues, obviously the pandemic, the global reckoning, you know, the, the global reckoning ab about race, but obviously, yeah. you know, incited uh, in this country. Um, and just how all of that creates a stew in terms of how we parent um, and how that affects our littles. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm working on now. Well, good luck. We will, we will look forward to that. Um, I want to also let everybody know before we go of a couple other um, Women on Wednesdays that we have coming up. Uh, let's see, next week we are going to talk about another historic um, uh, Black woman in politics, obviously our um, Vice President Kamala Harris um, with the author of a new book about her called Kamala's Way. Um, and then March 3rd, we are going to do um, a special program for International Women's Day with Gail Zima Kleman on her new book, uh, The Daughters of Kobani. And then uh, we are also going to do at the end of March, March 24th, 
uh, a new book that's coming out called Lucky by uh, Jonathan Allen of NBC and Amy Parnes of The Hill, who have written a new book um, about uh, the Biden campaign. Um, Lucky how Joe Biden barely won the presidency. And so we'll spend some time um, with them talking about the importance of um, how women voted in that election uh, and um, and how they how Biden actually put together um, that coalition and what what women had to do with that. So I hope you all can join us for that. And uh, Helena, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it was a, it's a great book, and I encourage everybody to um, to read it when they can. And um, thanks everybody for watching. Have a great week. Take care.